Hey, good morning. <laughs> what an unusual thing for me to be saying. I don't know if I ever say good morning uh, because I never do these in the morning. It's a delightful New England morning today. Sun shining like crazy. Everything bursting in the spring. Uh, the daffodils are out wildly uh, uh, over the hillside. You know, this is this is this is a this is an amazing thing that Creator has given us, isn't it? And the you know the feast to the eyes. You know, everything we're talking about is about that, isn't it? It's just a reflection of like a, a version of praise. Yeah, it's just a fantastic feast to the eyes. Just beauty everywhere. And of course, the source of painting is what we're talking about. Nature's the source, right? This is a day that, oh, your wonderful sunsets or the rest of them. Here, I'm preaching at you, so. <laughs> it's worthy of a moment, isn't it? Special days. Blaine came in with a question that um, uh, others have asked before, and I've never had a chance to really properly address it. So I'm going to uh, uh, get right on to this thing in um, and move, move us along. But um, while you're painting, she, he says, there was, a, and, and that was painting, this is that painting demonstration I use on the live stream. So while you're painting, there was a discussion about your start with white canvas. In Philip Hale's book on Vermeer, I just finished, Hale mentions Vermeer's canvas preparation with blue or green. I guess I wasn't surprised at the overall coolness of the final result, but was surprised uh, Vermeer actually prepared canvas, canvases this way. Uh, was the Boston School adamant about using white canvas? If yes, then what was the reason? If no, then what criteria was used when choosing a particular tone uh, from Blaine? Yeah, Blaine, that's very interesting because I've seen canvases by Vermeer that weren't toned in blue or green, but uh, but they still seem to have some sort of a tone on them. It looked like it's more like a, a more common uh, a, a sort of a, a pale brown, I'm trying to think, uh, yellow might be a better word for it. Um, I'm thinking I saw that. Uh, I'm, I'm just doing my recollection of the stolen one at the, uh, gee, I can't check up on me, at the, uh, at the uh, Gardner Museum, maybe. But uh, yeah, and so, but you think of that might have been in a bigger interior that was more warm in general, and that the Vermeer canvas uh, uh, of the, uh, at the Met, the, the pitcher, the woman with the pitcher of water, um, that, that whole room, because of the, of the windows, the uh, stained glass windows and that sort of thing, uh, might have been, um, might have been, he might have been in his, he just felt wise to give that a try. And I don't know if anybody was doing that at the time. Uh, Degas claims that uh, older painters had used uh, toned canvases, and he's talking about particular greens that he tortured Ruart with underpainting on uh, going to the museum and copying and having put down a, a uh, you know, heavy underpainting of green like that. And I have heard of that, some of those things before. Um, uh, but when it comes to the Boston School, that's a whole different story. And uh, we'll, we'll, let's go into that. But first of all, let me thank you, Gail, very much for that nice contribution again. And uh, hang in there. We love that. And, uh, and then, so, so as to, uh, uh, you know, Hale was a student of Vermeer. He looked very closely. He traveled and looked at all the Vermeers, I think, or as many as he could get his hand on, his eyes on. And he really did look closely at him. Anything he says uh, about his um, whatever, uh, if it's based on looking at the actual surface or getting to pull a canvas off and looking at it under the frame, out of the frame and looking at it under the frame, I would believe that he uh, knew what he was talking about. I have no reason to doubt him uh, in any case. So... Um, but a lot of painters have used uh, uh, tone canvases. When I was a student, uh, as a child, a five-year-old, I like to talk about the one-room schoolhouse that I was in. Actually, it was divided with a rubbery sort of a accordion divider into two classes at that point. I think it might have had four grades. But it was a one-room classroom. <laughs> one room, it was classic, you know. It, was, it came out of the Stone Age. It looks like it was built in maybe the 30s, one of those government-type projects that was happening at that time. Uh, in this country, and um, but this painting, this 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 Washington, George Washington, this is the Athenaeum, uh, the unfinished uh, Athenaeum, uh, George Washington, by Gilbert Stuart, was showing on the wall at the time. And my my education in painting began that day, and I don't remember anything out of school like I remember that. A couple of things, beautiful, wonderful, uh, ancient teacher. So there are some wonderful memories there, but. 
But uh, what I remember doing is looking like at down spots like this and seeing this scraggly edge of a canvas of the uh, rather of the brush, and then looking up here, and then looking down here and looking up here and thinking miracles, you know, thinking, you know, it was just I've been fascinated ever since, right? As probably many of you have for other reasons, but. That's the sort of thing that gets you into this game from the point of view of an analyst, I guess. Maybe I was born an analyst. But I was fascinated by what I saw there. And of course, I had a certain kind of, there's a certain kind of beauty, uh, there's a certain kind of love there, or whatever it is that Gilbert brought to George Washington. I understand that he was really beloved by his uh, countrymen in person. Um, but the glazed uh, thing, the undercurrent, you see, here's the, here's the Vermeer we were just talking about. Yes, there are times when it's done. Um, the one uh, we talked about is the Vermeer at the Met. The Frick and other ones don't show this heavy-handed feeling of blue. And uh, by the way, I remember doing this in a landscape. Once I painted a landscape rather a darkish orange, it certainly was a, an intense kind of an orange, more orange than what you see in this more orange than that. You probably know what it is, probably burnt sienna. And I remember painting a landscape, just wondering about what the heck that would do. And I remember noticing that it actually did, did give a certain kind of warms in certain places where I would probably never have seen the warms. And I thought to myself, now is this a good thing or a bad thing? But then it gave it a unity, but it never looked true. And I said to myself, that's not the model. That's not where I want to be. I want to actually paint I want the unity of nature. I want the truth of nature. I don't want some, 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 some gimmick or some technique to get me to unity. Now, and you're talking about imaginative painting. You're talking about having to create your own unity. That's a different story, believe me. But this, uh, this, this, this Maxwell Parish obviously starts on a white ground, right? Then he sets a blue on it. And apparently, as the story goes, he builds up either red and then over to yellow. I think maybe yellow is the last color he sets on top. So uh, as he does this series of glazes on that surface of white. And I think he talks about valuing that white underneath there as being important and the thinness of these uh, next subsequent tones like a watercolorist somehow being important. But I don't do that kind of work, so don't take it from me. I'm here to talk about the Boston School. We'll get to it as quick as we can. <laughs> so here's the underpainting of uh, Grisaille by, uh, by Ang. And a lot of people take that to be the way and I have no reason to believe that's the way. I don't think I've, I haven't seen enough examples of other people working this way to say that was the way. It's a way. Uh, some people, and he valued a drawing, and um, I'm talking about shape, form, and line so, so um, hugely that you can understand why a person like him, and, and put it over everything else. But he want, might have wanted to think that through, much like an impressionist wants to think through the color before he brings the drawing. This guy might have been wanting to just do that, have that chance to really think that through, really do his design just in black and white before he introduced color to the game. And he does bring beautiful, solid color eventually. He paints opaquely over this. I don't think I've seen much. There's a little indication of some glaze-like stuff in the flesh of the uh, nude odalisk at... Um, uh, at uh, the Fog Museum. But he talks about painting opaquely. And then here we have uh, David, his teacher, and I th what, from what I've seen, this is fairly typical. This is uh, David's painting this, what looks like it's going to be a portrait on a white canvas. And he's uh, going around doing some drawing and then he paints an object and goes from there. So, and here's Ang in further studies He's literally working on a, well, this is probably probably pretty white initially, and it's probably just yellow because there's, there's varnish all over it. And, uh, and here he is painting, you know, relatively somewhat thinly, but, uh, and, it, and it does look like he's doing more heavily the drawing and building the color up, but it's all, but it's not done on a heavy, uh, it's not done on a glaze that has any distinctive power. And I, my question is, which he did, uh, if I don't know that he always did the grisaille. I'm questioning whether he actually always did. But I haven't made it my study to do that. Uh, you know, the direct way, life is, you know, the, the, one of the things I've discovered is that sorting out painting is complicated enough. And, and there's so many various little, um, you know, devices people have used that take away 
from the directness of the problem, getting right to the problem, and you're looking for solutions, it seems to me, in so much the wrong places sometimes with this glazing stuff. But there are, there are reasons to do it, though. I'm not taking that away. Uh, so here you're talking about Jerome and the middle one, obviously, a drawing this on a, something close to white. I don't think it's that white. I think I've seen this in person. I don't remember it being that white a ground. But this is that line drawing and then <laughs> modeling up the, of the object just like I was going to say any illustrator. Me, when I illustrated something, I did that. And it's very efficient. Nothing, nothing wrong with it. But this probably wasn't glazed on. This is also a Jerome. This probably was not a glaze of green in which he popped that thing. I'm guessing he did it exactly like this on a lighter surface. And then you see all these marks as he's sort of general toning the background now for whatever reasons that is. Now, this becomes certainly the underpainting for everything else that follows, right? So that's another version of underpainting, but it just doesn't happen to be over this figure, under this figure. And that question might be answered, is that because he really wants the uh, white behind the, the figure, right? Things, that question has everything to do with the translucency of whites over time, you know, whether or not if you have a dark, if you're putting whites over a dark thing, will it drop dead over time? Here's even Bougro down here. And I've seen him tone like three different colors, a, a bluer note uh, and a redder one, but all of them living in this very near white value. So there's, these are all tone canvas, just the idea of what you might have as an undertone on a canvas. Now it does set off whites. I mean, as soon as you have a tone canvas, I remember doing that as a student after being a little bored with drawing, I would bring out a, a, a middle tone board, uh, a middle tone. I remember doing it on blue. Oh, you know, I have one here somewhere. Ah, should have dragged it out to show you. And, uh, and then drawing with the darks, drawing with the lights, both, you know, um, and uh, working my way from a middle tone. Uh, but that was just, again, just doing an object. Uh, but, there is a, but there is something about being able to see the highlights. When you're working on white paper, you don't get to see that. And if you're do doing a charcoal in full values, it's a different game also, but um, at least if you're trying to control the surface. Uh, so, another questions, other questions, I'm going too far with that, but here's Leonardo da Vinci in the upper right, and you can see the ground underlying that thing is pretty light. Um, may, again, the yellowing may be heavily related to the, um, to the um, varnish over years. There's a slight warmer quality up here, much heavier in greenishness here, and then greenishness in here, so he does appear to be setting sort of some sort of a tone in parts to this thing, which is an interesting idea. There are aspects of Impressionist painting that are like that. I don't think I'm going to get into that here, but I've alluded to them. That there are certain broad generalizations, but they, they keep color movement alive in them. Uh, this is a Teneretto, and you can see the ground under this looks like a piece of wood. And it's not uncommon, both of these might have been painted on wood. And um, and the wood itself appears to have been just varnished or something, in this case here so that you're painting literally on the color value of the wood, the color and value of the wood, and then you're imposing all your stuff on that. Um, now, would the reason for that be what? I mean, why wouldn't they lay over a whole layer of white, you know? But again, I suggest to you it's maybe just convenience, it's much more direct. You can go into, a, as I said, about the drawing I was doing, which I'll try to show you sometime, um, uh, where you, you can set up your highlights and your, you know, you can work you can work, as, as Sargent talks about, working from the middle tones, you can push your lights and push your darks at the same time and get a more engaged set of relationships. Uh, now, these are two examples that are really pushing it. <laughs> it's seriously dark. It's red, and this is, I think, a Tiepolo, the son of Tiepolo, uh, the great, the great uh, uh, ceiling, you know, muralist. And uh, so whatever he's doing, he's building it on a dark canvas. Uh, I don't know good reasons to do that. I honestly don't know good reasons. I do know, well, I'll get to talk about Degas in a second, because his reasons are, they give, they give the best reasons that you can have. This is also a Degas, though, and um, you can see that this white up here looks like it's been laid over dark. It looks like there is a tone like this everywhere. And again, he's, pushed, he's pulled the lights, pushed the darks, or darkened the darks and lightened the lights. But this is the question whether that light will be lost over time, getting gradually dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because there's this other thing under it. And also warming up more, and if it's trying to be a cool light. Uh, so you, it'll wind up with a unity, but will it be the unity of nature or will it be the unity of uh, 
of you, you know, of your painting being a victim to, uh, uh, you know, like like having a, an orange light glued over it or something like that, you know, <coughs> looking through uh, rose-colored glasses. Now, the, uh, the, the logic to me of a color, of a ground that's colored, that actually has color in it, is when you're doing imaginative work and you don't have a color scheme per se, you can say, I think I'm going to do, just for the fun of it, and he was totally experimental, he was all over the place. I think I'll do a green one today and put on some green that nobody would expect. Or he may have seen, as he claimed in uh, some paintings from ancient times, and, and tortured his student, student Ruart with, <laughs> with playing out unsuccessfully, apparently. Now, that's worth reading about, by the way, um, that student of Degas. But Degas would use uh, an, a, a tone like this, and you could see that you can set off a green in relation to this green. You can, set, you can find pinks that do the right thing in relation to this green, et cetera, you know, and you're in your search for a color scheme and gradually build every note based on watching this larger green. But that's an imaginative scheme, you know, an imaginative work being what it is, why not? And so, and, 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 and all paintings take on, by the way, more or less, as I've talked to you maybe in composition discussions, they take on a color. Every painting is more or less a red painting, a blue painting, a green painting, and, you know, they take on a dominant, uh, the overall general tonal, color, color, coloricity, uh, if that's a word, <laughs> Uh, of a picture, color, the overall color of a picture um, is um, uh, always there. So is this going to wind up being a warm painting? That's going to wind up being a cool green painting? If you're imaginative, it might, that might be what your goal was to, to say, you know, I think, I, I'm, I, think I'm gonna, I want this, this generally feels like it has under it logically a, a general color of gold. But when you're talking about the, the, the Boston School guys, uh, you're talking about the guys who used, from what I've seen, only two different grounds. One is a grayish one, and these photographs never really quite tell you the truth. You have to see these in person. But a grayish one, uh, like what you see between the leaves here, or maybe in some parts down here. Uh, I'm thinking maybe some, maybe, yeah, and I'm over here is a spot, maybe right there. And you can see how close that is to white, but that's a grayish one that you do see. And I actually purchased when I was a student. I purchased one from an old timer or from an estate or something, and there, they, there were a couple canvases there that were these beautiful grays. And they were clearly, the whole thing was, run, you know, it wasn't like it changed over time. It was really a, 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 an off-white toward the gray side, a neutralish thing. And I've seen it both in Metcalf as well, uh, where you can see those grounds, um, uh, Metcalf being not a Boston School painter per se, but, but of the same mindset with the background of Monet Really, it's worth talking about Monet because there's that ground where you see him working. It appears to be always working from a white canvas. And I just suggest to you, by the way, that over the years and years and years, the most paintings I've seen, when there's evidence of a ground, it's usually a white ground. But alternately, it's, it's not infrequently a ground that's more brown. And I do think that's probably caused by the original, the original, original use of wood underneath. And then maybe later painters trying to imitate that look to get closer to something a master was doing when he's painting on wood. But that's just speculation. But I, you can find in the background, in the in the between the, the marks, and this guy's a he makes flick flick type little marks. Uh, Metcalf does, and so you can find many spaces where he's using that ground in between, and just letting it exist. And um, and and very frequently it's of that same sort of gray as this one, but just very really slightly. And then other times it looks like it must have been white in the in the original. And the same thing is true of. Uh, both Sargent and uh, and uh, uh, De Camp, but this De Camp here, I don't think that's a true note. I think that's too dark. And but these, you know, the photographs online, they just you have to see this in person. Don't rely on even what I'm saying. You know, go look them up and see if they're true. But some of this stuff I base on sort of a, a, a lazy assumption that that yeah, that's probably true. But this actually looks like a dark ground, and I've never seen him use what I would call a dark ground. So I think something is happening here, and typically photographs, you know, we see online stuff. They're not infrequently there, or the ones you take with your phone or whatever. They're not infrequently contrasty in, in dubious ways, but still, that's if, even if he's using that, that's still the nearest thing you're going to see. The ground will be neutral if there's one at all. Uh, they they aren't using it in any kind of a studied way. Uh, and the one thing I can say to you is that sometimes you may use one, so you can start with your lights. 
and then push your darks, you know, and begin that, as I said, the push me, pull you from the middle tones. But the sergeant here has every reason, to, there's every reason to believe that this is, it was a white ground. This stuff wouldn't have hung so light over the time. And these spots over here, they look like the kind of marks you've all made when you have a slightly oily uh, paint and you're painting over something very light, you'll get that kind of translucency on a lighter surface. You'll probably find in uh, places like in the hair uh, that the paint has, um, has gotten thicker, but these are the ones you'd have to look at in person to see if that's true. But there's other evidence in different spots. We usually can find uh, the actual ground in a, in a start of a painting. The start's a very good thing to look at. And so let's see, let me just look at the way, I'll just talk to you about the way I, these are demonstrations I've done in the classroom. And both of the, all these, both of these were done on, uh, on light, and I always do them on white canvases, as the, what, the demonstration you're seeing in the, uh, in the thing we're doing together uh, on the live stream, when you're, the demonstration you're watching me do. And, uh, and I do, just coincidentally, by the way, I use the white of the paper to find the, a darker value for the lights. And so I'm trying to get, make sure that my lights, my lightest lights in here are always looking like they're, they're, they're darker than the white. I use the white, in other words, as a, as a, as a, as the lightest light of, of nature of my palette. And I say, I know that if I want color, if I want color in a white, it's going to have to be darker than that. And typically that's true. Once in a while, some of the yellows, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's hard to see the difference. But anyway, that's just a conversation. But these are done that way. And, and you have no problem in the first day, these demonstrations of getting the canvas covered enough to adequately set up the big value relationships. I suggest to you that this set of the way the darks and midtones are used is similar to what you're seeing inevitably for, work, for anybody who's, who's covering, working on a, on a light canvas, you'll get that kind of a look. But yeah, so, but the model we have instead of trying to get unity, and let me go back to, um, to that here, this one, or these two. The model we have, instead of trying to get unity by, by means of the, um, of the uh, uh, um, a device, like blue underneath everything, is we actually have disciplined our eyes. And the whole motive is to, is to make every spot true uh, to itself and deliver on the unity of the big impression. Every spot being a contributor conscientiously. And um, the mosaic mentality a little bit, you know, only in that sense that every spot is, every spot has its, you know, it has its own color, has a right to its own note, every, every spot you go to in an impressionist painting. So there's a, the unity is not coming in, a, in an artificial way and part of what gives it its truth and, and not a look of having unity, but it's unity, the unity of the truth of the look of nature in front of you, the truth of the unity of the daylight here. is a product of that long study of these inner relationships with the search for how this hangs together, you know, with the search for the thing in front of you. Uh, uh, coming into that one thing that you see when you look. Of course, that's why I say to you, you have to get a concept of that one thing, that, that great essence of the thing here painting. Uh, so that you're always aiming at that. But, um, but the argument is that the unity of an Impressionist is literally just the unity of nature itself. So that's a big exploratory. Uh, not, that's not speaking compositionally, that's speaking coloristically uh, and in terms of tones. So it's not just that all the stuff inside a painting by an Impressionist hangs together, but it hangs together in the way that nature did it, not in the way that, um, you know, Jerome did it, okay? Not that they're all borrowing from nature, so don't let that be a confusing thing to you, okay? Here again, you can see that there's spots in between these things. That's simply a reflection of texture. Uh, the trees definitely having texture or some stuff coming through. It's not about, uh, it, but in the long run, in the general impression, you know, there's going to be a cooler green up here, lighter, richer ones down here, and so on, all the way through this thing. And you're looking for how this whole thing hangs together. That's our unity. And I think that's the great value in addition to which, of course, there's not going to be any strange darks. What, what would it be if you had this on a dark panel and all this, and you have this beautiful, beautiful light effect, and then five years later, all of a sudden, you see this weakening happening? Now, you can say it's unifying, pictorially unifying, and that is a discussion of pictorial unity. But it's pictorially unifying, but it's not unifying, but it's losing the unity of the first impression. 
So that's the kind of world the Boston School guys live in. I hope I've, I've covered that a little bit reasonably for you, uh, Blaine, and for everyone. Again, Blaine, thank you for that question. Uh, much appreciated. And your involvement recently, I've enjoyed that. Um, so again, guys, uh, Blaine said this to me in an email. Don't hesitate to use email if that's, uh, if that's a form that uh, you find more comfortable than, or if you can't type in on, under a picture or something like that. If you have a question, please get it off to me, okay? And uh, my email is ingbretson, my spelling of my name, I-N-G-B-R-E-T-S-O-N, ingbretson underscore mark, um, studio.com, at yahoo.com, ingbretson underscore studio at yahoo.com. So do feel free to do that. So I think that does it for today. Um, and I think I'm going to let it... I'm, I've run late for my... <laughs> I'm hoping we get this to you. I hope you're seeing this on a Thursday, but if you're seeing it on a Sunday, you'll know what caused that. It was me. Uh, I had to do a retake because I forgot to turn the, the, the um, <laughs> camera on. All right. So, again, thank you all for your kind con donations. Thank you, Gail, for your nice donation today. And, uh, and, and uh, thank you all for your subscribing. We've now surpassed our 10,000 mark. I'm just impressed as heck. And we're, just, and we're now and moving again. So some of you guys must have gotten involved in some way back there because you jumped it up just about the time I was asking you to. <laughs> that last live stream was, we hoped it would be a celebration, and it was, of our, of our 10,000th uh, subscriber. So I think we're at 10,003 now. So uh, looking forward very much to, uh, I think 10,300, not, not, um, not th yes, right. That's what, that's what I said there, right? Okay. Anyway, thank you for sharing. Thank you for uh, comments. Uh, please keep them coming. And, um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Um, I want to run one thing by you all. Um, you know we're doing a live stream again. Um, the um, uh, in a few weeks and uh, and we're covering the, I'm, and I did, yeah I mean we're, we're I'm doing a uh, showing you a demonstration I did that was videotaped and I'm going to talk over it this time probably exclusively talk over it we'll see uh, but I want to ask you a different question if anyone wants to respond to this I'd appreciate it um, and that is I'm thinking about having Mr. Dunley and myself Tom Dunley the two of us who have studied with Gamel be together live on one of these live streams. Not right away. It will be a few weeks, a few, a couple months out. But and have you guys do hit and run kinds of questions? I've heard they call it lightning questions or something. My, it was suggested to me by Alistair. Uh, thanks, Alistair. But I and I have to uh, clarify exactly how that'll work. But but it looks like we could sit there and you could just throw questions at us. We could have some fun. It would be a, and it would be your fresh look, fresh listen. Uh, I'd be interested in what you think of that. And then the second thing I would say, by the way, that if we're going to do it, I would really appreciate it if you all getting to know who RHI's Gamel was, the guy that gave us really our, our leg up on the deeper understanding of painting uh, and, and success in it, um, was, um, uh, uh, he's the author of several books and, um, and uh, I would want you to read, have read The Twilight of Painting if you haven't already. And anything else you can find by him, the shop talk of Edgar Degas, and I have for free. I'll send to you the uh, his annotations uh, under um, uh, Ang via Amari Duval, which is he translated from the French and then did annotate it as an art, you know, as a painter artist. He's got unique value. Uh, but so read wherever you can if we're going to do this. In any case, I better get out of this. Uh, um, I am uh, looking forward to seeing you in another week. Hope you have a great spring.